Our next guest uh, is going to talk about the year of Ethereum, which is a lot of people talking about for 2022. Um, it's it's basically, this is what Paul Brody, a global innovation leader at Ernst Young, is arguing. Um, he makes his case in an opinion piece that was published on Coindesk.com, and he's here now to explain why he takes this position. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you. Uh, Hey. Good to see you, and thank you for your. You've been quite prolific lately with your contributions to to Coindesk. So keep it up; it's all good. Um, look, I I read your piece, and I thought, like, is Paul just looking to get into a fight with Bitcoin maxis? Because you start out like like identifying that there's this meme induced fog of propaganda between Bitcoin maximalists and Ethereum boosters. You know, you're, you're talking about this fight in some respect that's just been going on for ages. And then the first thing you do is come out and say, first and foremost, 2022 is all about Ethereum. So, so clearly, you know, you're looking to pick a fight maybe, but where do you stand on, on this, the, the fact that there is this, you know, people who are dismissing Jack Dorsey being one of the most prominent of them, the Web3 Ethereum thing is all being about fluff. What you, what's your answer to them? So my answer is I'm not an Ethereum maximalist. I am, to, to, to coin a term, I'm an Ethereum practicalist. And what I mean by that is that um, I look at the history of technology and I think a lot about sort of what happens when a digital ecosystem reaches escape velocity. And the answer is it, it becomes dominant not because it's the best, not because uh, it has the, the most brilliant people, but because it is widely used, right? And the analogy I often make is, if I was going to write a PC application, I wouldn't say, what's the best PC operating system? I would say, who's got the most users? And the answer is, the Ethereum ecosystem has the most users, it has the most capital, it has the most software developers, and that means that it's going to become the dominant ecosystem, not because it's the best, because the best technology never wins, but just because for practical purposes, that's where you want to build your business. Hey, Paul, I like your unicorn T-shirt, first of all. Um, but um, e e everything you said about Ether, points well taken, but there's also, Ethereum has one big vulnerability, which is high gas fees, right? And this has been a consistent problem. And, you know, with the upgrade of last year, it made gas fees a little bit more predictable, but didn't actually lower them. And I know this is something that people are hoping for with ETH 2.0, but this is what's kind of opened up the market to these so-called ETH killers. How, what is your... What is your take on ETH gas fees and when do you see that problem finally getting more under control? So that problem was solved six months ago. And this is where the conventional wisdom is out of sync with, with the reality and we'll catch up relatively quickly. So uh, six to nine months ago, we were spending 30, 40, $50 to execute every single transaction. Today, we spend about two cents or less, right? We gave out New Year NFTs to 8,000 people and it cost us like a hundred bucks. So uh, the answer is when you move to layer two on Polygon, right? You have all the benefits of the Ethereum ecosystem with very reliable gas fees. And so uh, the layer two kind of transition is been in the end much more important than this mythical kind of ETH 2.0. Uh, so ETH 2.0 is coming, but what people are missing is that Ethereum is demonstrating all the kind of maturity we want from a, a, an industrial scale ecosystem. They do hard forks every three months. They've got super boring technical committees that sound a lot like the IETF, right? Ethereum is behaving like a mature technology infrastructure that's going to scale nicely. And the gas fee problem is actually over, in my opinion. So I'd push back on that a little bit just because, you know, I was playing around on OpenSea recently and trying to make an NFT and ETH gas fees were still in the hundreds of dollars, which, you know, just for experimenting with an NFT, that's a pretty high barrier to entry, right? So I guess, I mean, I, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't say that they're over. I think it's still an issue. And, and again, you know, what Solana kind of boasts that, you know, it doesn't have that same problem. How do you see this sort of ETH and Solana rivalry playing out this year? So the... I see all of these other chains uh, uh, as kind of not yet prepared to acknowledge the fact that, that Ethereum won. And if you're paying hundreds of dollars in gas fees, it's because uh, you're not able to access that NFT on a layer two system like Polygon. So what those high gas fees are going to do, and, and Vitalik was very clear about this, the future of Ethereum is as a chain that other blockchains use to integrate. So our multi-chain future is an Ethereum future with sort of EVM compatible layer twos transacting with each other. And if you want low gas fees, whether it's for an NFT or a DeFi transaction, you're gonna do it in layer two. The layer two transition is not complete, right? And it still frustrates me when I try to go and do stuff and I find that I can't do it on layer two. I agree with you. If it's on layer one, the gas fees are too high for anything other than a blockchain or a large institution. 
So, Paul, I mean, you really are hardcore about it because you, you, you say that, look, the likes of Cosmos uh, making a multi-chain world of interoperability is not going to happen, I, or, or at least that that's what it seems like is what you're saying, right? You're saying that this is yeah. sort of a, a fool's errand, uh, you know, so... Uh, so is I'm, that really how you're going to see you could, you see these 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 projects ultimately failing? I, I do, and this this sounds harsh, but it's it's what we've learned from the history of technology. So go back 20 years. I'm 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 really dating myself, but uh, in the early days of the internet, we had TCP/IP, right? The sort of uh, internet control. Um, mechanism that was used to connect up all these heterogeneous different block uh, this, these different networks right there was all kinds I can remember getting um, I can remember getting a, a, a token ring network adapter like the size of my fist once for a, a laptop by hand right those are things that we used to have now it's all Ethernet on IP and it's just IP networks being connected to IP networks I need somebody to tell me why a blockchain technology ecosystem is going to somehow mature in a very different way than almost all other networking infrastructures and again I'm I'm drawing upon analogies from history here not trying to be like an eth is best i'm just trying to be like hey this this is where i think this is going to go based on how things have played out in other industries and technology stacks you know, you're wearing a unicorn T-shirt. My daughter's favorite things, unicorns and zombies. And you talk about zombies uh, in layer one, ultimately, that it will need to convert to layer two. So which platform is going to do that? And which, which one's just going to go nowhere? So there are already lots of blockchain platforms that have tons of money uh, and are, are busy rebranding themselves. We're seeing this in enterprise clients. We'll get three quarters of the way through a deal and it'll be to, to help a client build something on Ethereum. And then some other blockchain will come around and say, hey, listen, we will pay all the money to implement this project if you do it on our blockchain. And you know, it's hard for enterprises to turn down that kind of money. We're going to see big money being thrown at these types of opportunities. But at the end of the day, you know, Ethereum does more trans that ecosystem, whether it's Ethereum or the layer two like Polygon, it's doing more transactions in a day than many of these uh, systems are doing in a year. And if you want to sell product to a large ecosystem of buyers, you're going to pick strategically. And so I, I see uh, that kind of playing out in that direction. You know, but one of the things I think is kind of cool about all this is that, you know, it is a bet on the permissionless future. It is this idea that uh, blockchains are going to go the way of, of something that we all, at least in this space, tend to want to look for, where there is literally nobody in charge. And you and I have discussed this in the past. You know, you're uh, a bit of an anomaly in the consulting world because, you know, EY is truly going from this permissionless model, whereas for some time there, a lot of the consulting firms were really pushing permissioned solutions for companies, that they would build these consortia and they'd get together. And the enterprise blockchain story really didn't get very far on that basis. But our companies, the kind of clients that EY has, at this stage, ready to take the leap into something as unpredictable as a permissionless system like Ethereum? So your, your question is perfectly timed because the answer is yes. And it's very interesting. So every year in January, I poll all of the EY global partners who are willing to sort of take the time to answer me. And I ask them where they think they're seeing blockchain in terms of their clients. And I would share with you two preliminary observations from the data that's come back so far this year. First of all, uh, the level of client interest in blockchain and, and sort of the level of, of clients saying they're more interested in blockchain is at its highest ever, right? And I've been doing this poll every year for five years. Secondly, um, the percentage of clients who say that they believe that the futures on a public blockchain is at its highest ever. It's, it's the vast majority. Now, they fall into two camps. There's one camp that's like, hey, uh, public blockchains are here and I'm ready for it. And there's another camp that says public blockchains are here and I'm not ready for it. But together, those two camps, which understand that the futures in public blockchains represent now the majority of uh, our expected answers from enterprise clients. So people understand, like, the market's there, the money's there. If I want to participate, that's where I need to go.